And now, Father, I pray, Lord, pour out your spirit upon us. Continue, let us continue, Lord, in worship to you. And let your word be spoken this morning in your word alone, received. In Christ's name, amen. You know, I'm going to warn you, this uh, sermon needs a little humor this morning, so I'm going to start off with a little, some of you heard this recently, but it, it's just a little bit of humor, related not at all to the sermon, so just forget about it. But the little girl's in Sunday school, right? And she's asked the question, uh, what is a lie, Sally? Can you define a lie? And the little girl says, yes, a lie is an abomination to the Lord and a very present help in time of trouble. I guess I can say this is no lie today. This is okay. I'm going to talk about parenting. As parents, most of you and I, as Becky and I have, you pray for your children, and if you're like we are, you pray with varying degrees of success. God has been gracious and answered many of our prayers, but one key prayer we have, Becky and I, for our daughter remains unfulfilled, and that is that she returns to her Christian roots. She gave her life to Christ when she was about seven and she took it back again when she was about 13 and she's still holding on to it and we've been praying now 13 43 for 30 years that she would return to her faith surrender again her life to the Lord and well she's not uh, back yet but we keep praying and I know all of you have prayers like that prayers uh, vitally important to you that seem to be in accordance with God's plan and will but where we didn't see an answer. We, if the prayer wasn't fulfilled in the way that we were expecting, if at all. And I know prayers are answered, many prayers, most prayers. There are tons of prayers that are answered. What we pray for comes to pass, or at least we see some change as a result. We know there's a difference, and we see that God has acted in some way. But many prayers, some prayers, even the ones we're passionate about, sometimes go, seem to go unanswered. We seem sometimes to be met with silence. Well, I keep talking about our grandson, forgive me, but it's still fresh in our hearts and minds. Thousands of people prayed for Nick that he would recover. He'd get his sight back and receive full brain function again. And people prayed thousands with passion, but he remains blind and impaired substantially. And, and most of you would have a similar story, not about a grandson, but about something in your life where you have prayed for, with fervor and for deliverance. Many times we're answered, sometimes, however, the illness doesn't go away, the pain doesn't stop, we're not released from the suffering and anxiety. Sometimes it seems that the Lord leaves us uh, stuck in our mess, if I can say it that way. And so, with all that as background, maybe we can agree this morning that we have no problem identifying with John the Baptist, who Jesus leaves stuck in prison. John, as you remember, uh, we've been reading about John the last couple of weeks. John had a great, bold, and dangerous ministry for Jesus Christ, for the Messiah. He was the first to proclaim, Behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. Behold, he, Jesus is there, the Son of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold, John came out strongly against the Jews. You remember last Sunday's reading, he rebuked the Jewish leadership. You brood of vipers, he said. You think, you know, rough translation, you children of Satan, children of the snake, you brood offspring. He was nasty, bold. He called for repentance because the Messiah was gonna baptize with a sword and with fire. John could be bold Partly, at least, partly, I think, because the Messiah who was going to come with vengeance and to deliver Israel from her enemies, the Messiah is here. And so John could speak with boldness, right? Emboldened by Messiah's presence. John was, well, he was outrageous, publicly attacking Herod, a vicious and corrupt king. You remember John denounced him as morally unfit to rule because he had taken his brother's wife. Herod did jail John, and John has been hanging out effectively on death row. He's in Herod's prison, no hope of getting out, and was figuratively speaking, at least an ax poised over his head. And it's been a while. John is 
probably okay with this because he's still, he's certain he's on the winning side, right? The, the Messiah is going to step up and he's going to rout Rome and take care of Herod. John knows he's going to be delivered, but it's been a year now, maybe a year and a half, maybe two years since Jesus has come and Jesus has not stood up against Rome or Herod, not even a little bit. Jesus hasn't seized power. Jesus is going about the, the countryside. He's doing wonderful things. He's teaching, he's telling parables, he's healing, doing lots of miracles, but he hasn't challenged Rome or Herod. Jesus knows the danger John's in. And put yourself in John's position. I hear all these things about him. He's going about doing this. So, but he hasn't helped me. So maybe can we identify with John the Baptist just a little bit? There are some times we have those prayers. We're kind of stuck in a mess and we pray and ask and pray and ask, but it doesn't seem to change. We're ill or in a bind or in a crisis or lost is at hand, but Jesus doesn't seem to be acting. What do we do with that? And I suggest uh, that what we do with it, we can see what we do with it from what John did with it. He's a good model for us when we're stuck in a mess. The first thing we see about John is his patience. He's been in jail maybe a year, maybe 18 months, maybe two years, we're not sure, under threat of execution before he finally sends a message to Jesus. Now put yourself in that position. What message would you have sent? Get me out of here, right? I could have died at any minute. What are you doing? John's message is a little different. John has patience. John says, um, are you the one who was to come? Or is there another? Do we expect someone else? It's a very mild, gentle sort of question. Patience. John has remarkable patience. James tells us in the lesson this morning to have patience with the Lord. Be patient with the Lord. It's another way of saying trust God. He has perfect timing and perfect answers, but we have to wait. Farmers know this. He said the fruit's going to come in when it comes in, and God has set the time. God's established that. Be patient, trust, wait. If you push the harvest too early, you spoil the fruit. Be patient. John is patient. His life is under threat. He trusts the Lord to do what's right. He just wants to know kind of when. Is it going to be soon, or do we have to wait uh, for someone else? John has patience. Can we be patient, you and I, with the Lord and trust him even in the suffering, even when the pain doesn't stop, even when we're in the mess, that his timing is perfect? John also shows us what to do while we wait, while the prayer is not answered, which is talk to the Lord. We don't have to send messengers. We can go direct. Just have a conversation with the Lord. Express our concerns. John does. He says, you know, uh, can you talk to me about this? Jesus, I thought you were the one. Uh, I'm still in a mess. Can you, are you the one? Or do I have to wait for somebody else? Good thing to do while we're waiting. Talk to the Lord. If we don't get an answer to prayer that we wanted, we don't think he's helping. We think we, well, go to, we go to him and we say, help me with this. Am I asking amiss? Do I not understand what you're looking for here? Can you help me, Jesus? Can you calm my heart? And he will. He will strengthen our faith. He does that with John. He comes back strongly. He says, yeah, I'm, I am the Messiah. That stuff that's reported about me, go read Isaiah. That's exactly what Isaiah said the Messiah is going to do. The blind are seeing and the deaf are hearing and the lame are walking and the, and the mute are speaking and the dead are being raised. I am the Messiah, and blessed are you, John, you don't take offense, because I'm not doing what you want when you want it. And finally, lastly, we see in John's situation the problem, I think, that we have with some of our prayers, at least, which is that we're asking too little. John is asking probably for the biggest thing he can imagine which is that 
the Messiah is going to throw out the Romans and throw out Herod and restore Israel to his glory as a, as a kingdom and that he's of course going to be released from jail and the, and, and the beheading get him off of death row but that was far too small a request for the work of the Messiah God had something infinitely bigger in mind to do through Messiah, not to release Israel from foreign domination, but to release all of human race, the whole human race, from the oppression and bondage of sin. <laughs> John's asking, do you fix this problem? And God's saying, I'm going to fix this problem. Not seeking victory over the land of Israel, but victory on a cosmic scale over the domination of Satan. Not vengeance and re retribution on some temporal political power but vengeance and retribution on all evil and sin God's justice satisfied for all humanity for all time John was praying but his hopes for Messiah were way too small his prayers too limited his vision tiny think about it if Jesus had come against Rome against Herod where would we be Suppose he had jumped in and rescued John. Would he have gotten his message across well enough? Would we have understood? Would the Gospels have been written? Would he have been crucified on the cross? Would he have died for our sins if he had picked his timing and not the Lord's? Are we not like John sometimes? We pray for our circumstances our particular problem and we should God says to pray ask him for what we need a healing or fixing a relationship or a job or an inadequate income or whatever it is we're to pray absolutely but when our prayers are not answered the way we thought they should be maybe it's because maybe it's because we've been a little too small in our prayer we want relief from a crisis but God may want much more than that. He might want our hearts. He, want, he might want to see our trust and our patience and our perseverance. We want something fixed, but he, he wants us. He wants our, our hearts fully committed to him. We want the pain stopped, but he wants us made into new people. We want a short-term fix, but by his Holy Spirit at work in us, he wants us transformed into holy people. And sadly, at least most of us find it sad, we grow best in suffering. So, what will it be when we're stuck in something, stuck in a mess, and God seems distant and our prayers seem to bounce back to us, the heavens like brass, what will we do? Shall we, can we, will we model against John? Model what we see in John the Baptist. Patience. Trust in the Lord. You know, trust is not I ask God and he gives me what I need. Trust is I ask God and I await his timing, his, his perfect timing. Can we go to him in the meantime and ask for his input, his encouragement? Or, uh, show me where I'm wrong change my heart change my prayers let me understand Lord and then if our prayer is unfulfilled could we consider that maybe he's asking us to look within that he's looking for something bigger in our lives a new level of trust something beyond what we've ever asked or imagined a transformation and so, last question, can we do that as a church, as a parish? Trinity Church. I know we want things to change. We want our problems solved. Not that we have any, but if we did, we'd want them solved, right? We want to be fully staffed up again. We want to see the bank account full. We want new members coming in. We want our youth group react, uh, reinvigorated, bigger crowds, uh, we want children's ministry to be revitalized. We want a lot of things. And we pray. Can we be patient and trust God that he will do here in this church the right thing, his perfect plan in his timing? 
continue to pray, but to look for, to him for the big picture. What is it? Are we too small in what we're praying for? Can he, we see that he may have something beyond what we're imagining here? And pray for that. Knowing that he will give us not what we want necessarily, but what we need. I invite you to model after John the Baptist. And I'm going to try that myself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the picture you give us of John's faith and his patience. A man who thought he was going to be delivered from prison, but who was beheaded. Can you help us to live as he lived, knowing that your plan is the best. In Christ's name, amen.